Hey, what's up, Leron here. Thank you for joining me in another video. Today, I'm gonna do a study of John Singer Sargent. I'm gonna paint this one, The Lesson, by him. That is, I believe, his sister Emily and his two, uh, whatever it is, I forgot, but all of them are relatives, and she's giving them a painting lesson. Now, a couple of pointers, and I wrote it down for myself. First, Sargent's style, and you can see this is my study as well, it's pretty direct. It's in a way messy, but in a pretty way. He has this way of approaching the, the scene he sees in a very direct manner. And it's actually fascinating to see him apply this to watercolor and not just to oil. Because you get to see that very same approach and also in the original painting, which I'll hopefully show you uh, here and in the study as well. Now, another thing is that I'm actually working on secondhand uh, impression here. I have some notes for myself. This is a secondhand impression. So I'm working from his impression. I don't see the original scene which makes things a little harder. Hopefully you will enjoy seeing with me the process as it unfolds and maybe we can learn a thing or two. So with that being said, let's get started. So I thought I'd do something a little different. A lot of people have been asking for um, the longer videos, really showing the process, talking about everything. So at the risk of making this video really long and maybe boring to some, I'm going to go for that. Hopefully that will reduce my pressure of having to feel like I need to talk fast and explain quickly everything I'm doing uh, because I need to cram in a lot of explanation because there's a lot going on on screen. So no time lapse. I didn't cut out anything. I think I haven't cut, cut out anything. So you'll see the whole thing bil being built slowly. I will put in the description box um, the, you know, uh, timestamps so you can skip this if you want to get to the painting stage. I'm going to put everything is going to be linked down below so you can uh, skip to whatever part you want, skip freely between the parts, you know, uh, and so on. So, as you can see, again, the John Singer Sargent, one of his things is really, in a way, a very direct sort of dumb, and I know I'm kind of saying this ironically, kind of dumb approach to painting in which he's he seems to be putting things where he wants them to be without fearing too much for the overall technique. He knows things will work out. Uh, the, the, the reason, partially I would guess, is that he is super experienced. Um, he was super experienced at the time of making this and he had so much experience from oils that translated really well to watercolor as well. And so his vision, his mastery of the basics was so good that he didn't need any fancy technique. And by the way, it's not like his technique is terrible. I mean, look at some sections in this painting. They're really fluid and, and really beautiful. Um, it's a bit too crowded and crammed, especially with the background grass for me and for my taste, but uh, it's just wonderful. So now that we uh, talked a bit about the painting itself, uh, let's talk about what I'm doing. So the drawing process, this is a highly complex scene when it comes to drawing, because people are among the most difficult subjects there are, and we have three people here. Um, and the background is not as complex or as big of a challenge here. Uh, there's the, the tripod or the easel for painting. That's fine. That's not too complex. But the thing is, to make this work on a detailed level, you have to first figure out where everything is on a macro level. So what you saw me doing is blocking in three blobs, essentially. One on the right, one in the middle, and one on the left, a little behind. Now. I look at the blobs I got, and, and now I'm obviously a little more advanced into working out the details of the middle blob, but what I'm doing is, here we go, and we're getting to work on the right side blob. I'm just trying to figure out if the relations of the blobs fit the ones of the characters. So I'm kind of drawing an outline of the entire character in a way. Sometimes I'm winging it. With this one, I actually put in the hands, I show where they are. I don't do any complex reconstruction of the figures. I'm just drawing them as I see them, but I'm going very slowly, okay? I'm building up the shapeless blobs. Well, they're not shapeless, they're, their shape is really an attempt to mimic what I see. And then I slowly start to divide them into their major components. So for the one I'm working on right now, one of his nephews, you can see that her legs, and that's one big shape, her hands, uh, the head, the hat, uh, all of these different elements 
if you want to get them accurately, first you have to make sure you got the the woman or the, the the children or whatever it is, the tree, anything you draw, you have to figure out you put them in the right place, okay? And that's really important. So I really am careful with this. Again, people are highly complex. And for this kind of a sketch, you don't need much more than just looking at it, trying to see it cleanly and drawing it. It comes with time. It's a lot of practice. You can try all sorts of things like I'm slowly starting to learn. Like you have obviously the grid method if you don't want to mess up your proportions. You can trace. I don't care. Get the drawing done in whichever way you want. I think the best way to go at it is to work on your observation skills. You have to see things as they really are. Not necessarily as maybe the illusion in your own mind dictates that they look. You cannot guess or assume. You have to really look at the reference carefully. And I make this mistake all the time. Everyone makes this mistake. It's very easy to get into autopilot and say, oh, I know what a head looks like, and bam, I put a circle, and it doesn't even make sense, you know? And you'll see me do this here. Um, so you want to really understand why things look the way they look, why things appear. Like, for example, why her umbrella looks like that? Why is the base of the umbrella a, a, a elliptical kind of shape you know because we're looking at it at an angle if you can understand same goes for the hat of uh, Emily his, um, his sister or was it his aunt I forgot but the woman in the middle same goes for her you see the hat is kind of an, an oval shape an elliptical shape around her head because we're looking at it at an angle if you can understand why things appear the way they are and you have good observational skills you will really improve your drawing. Um, I definitely came from the camp of just observing and just drawing, which is very useful for painting. But I am trying to work on my reconstruction skills, so to speak. Um, so you see me now slowly dividing the cloth in her uh, clothes into different sections, whether it's indicating where her hands are, where all the folds and creases are, slowly building that up. I want to make sure that every time I progress with the drawing, I really pay attention to having it still work together on a more whole, holistic way, as I always say. I really want to make sure that the face makes sense when I look just at the face. And I have a lot of inaccuracies here, especially with the faces. They're very hard to do. And honestly, if I wanted to, if I wanted to get them really this, the exact same, uh, this would have taken way longer. I'd have to zoom in way more. I may have to use, uh, you know, just very slow measurement and really make sure to get everything right. What I'm looking for is getting the, the most out of why he did this painting the way he did and then move on. Uh, that's how I usually do my studies. Once every blue moon, I feel like really going detailed. But for the most part, that's not what I'm about. Okay, so now she actually holds the brush in her mouth, which is very common. I do that a lot, especially plein air, when it, you don't always have a place to put everything. Um, and by the way, let me know what you think of these videos in terms of... I, I don't assume that everyone who watched the video actually is going to paint this, obviously. And I don't assume that you will even watch the entire process. But I'm actually curious to hear if just listening to me speak... Uh, is interesting enough to carry you through this video. Maybe you once in a while look at the drawing, see the progress I made or the painting, and then you go back to doing whatever it is you're doing. Because I know I sometimes watch videos like that. Um, so just let me know your thoughts on that. I'm really curious, and these comments help me. And even though I don't answer to all comments, I try. I've been trying to answer and reply to a lot of them lately, and hopefully I reply to yours, but I read everything. Um, so we got the easel there, and... It, Again, for these shapes, you have to really look at the, understand the angle. It's kind of a rectangular or square shape at an angle. We're looking at it slightly from above and it's tilted to the side. All of these things are things you really want to pay attention to. It's very easy to mess up the, the drawing. Now, I do want to make one more comment. We're already nine minutes into the video and I still haven't gotten the final details in. And I mention this for a reason. I see a lot of people that jump straight into the final details. Take your time, okay? Like I'm taking my time with narrating this video. As you notice, I'm less in a hurry. Take your time with the drawing, okay? Really give it the respect it deserves because it will carry 
the painting over. And a good drawing is, uh, you know, Joseph Zbukovic says you cannot ruin it too much with the painting stage. And I believe a good drawing encourages you to do better in the painting stage. So you want to get it as accurate as you can. And notice how it paid off. Again, I have a lot of inaccuracies, but look at uh, the sergeant's nephew on the left and how she intersects with Emily in the middle and her hat. Look at how accurate I got that in terms of placement. That would have never been possible had I just jumped straight into the details. You see? So you really want to pay attention. Now I'm drawing her hand. I think it came out <laughs> really a little too large, but that's fine. Um, for hands and different elements like that, I know a lot of people find challenging. It does help to learn very basic anatomy. Like if you can learn how the shape of the fingers fans out and you can figure out how to draw them properly. It, there's a lot, there are a lot of tricks and good little things you can learn and they will always help you. And it doesn't take l too long to learn them. You can really learn a lot of these things fairly quickly. Now, while we're drawing, you can already pay attention to uh, the, the painting stage. If you look at the, the original work, uh, notice how Sargent was uh, very keen on uh, conveying the temperature. And one of his big things is layering warms and cools in an interesting way. If you just look at Emily in the middle, her entire clothing is made up of a lot of uh, cool colors for the base color, like a blue, kind of a warm blue, but it's still a blue. And then together with that, that brown, that's a little darker even. So you get this very interesting play of warms and cools almost anywhere. Well, look at, the, again, the nephew and or on the right, the one I'm drawing right now. Look at her uh, blouse or shirt, I don't know what you'd call that uh, shirt probably, in the shadow. It's blue. The shadow is really cool, but the shirt itself is warm. The, the hat is relatively warm. There's a lot of interest there. Now, look at, look at her uh, face and profile view. If you compare it to her shoulder, I got the shoulder really long. I got her legs, you see the, the head should be more to the left. So you see, I mess up a lot, that's fine. I, I, I drew her really squeezed in. Now I am working hard on improving my people. Uh, so that's something that will hopefully improve. Um, and again, when I film, it's a little different. I'm a little more in a hurry subconsciously. So had I drawn this really at my leisure, it would have been probably better, um, I will admit. But it still will work out in the overall impression. It's not going to hurt it too much. So don't worry about getting every single thing right, especially if your love is for watercolor, not just the drawing stage. If you're really into drawing, work hard on it, get, you know, get build as much skill as you can. But if you're more interested in the painting stage, I have nothing against really blasting through the drawing stage quickly. So we actually finished with the drawing stage. Now, uh, look, the initial wash here is quite simple. I'm going at it fast. <laughs> that's, I'm in my zone now. Uh, I really warmed up. Uh, look at the painting. There are several areas that are lighter highlights on the hats, uh, on the, the, the figures in different places, even in the background. So what I'm doing is I'm doing an initial wash to tie everything together a little bit. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable going straight into different sections of the painting. That seemed a little silly. Uh, so I'm just covering everything up but the highlights. Some of these highlights I'm going to dumb down later. Okay, So I'm not going to keep them completely... Um, they're not going to be necessarily as dark as you see them now or as light as you see them now. I will um, change some of them. But for now, I'm just concerned with getting an initial wash with very few colors. Okay, I don't worry too much about getting too strong colors or anything like that. And just keeping it flowing, keeping it unified, keeping it even. Okay, so that's my main concern here. Uh, and I'm just free flowing between some warmth, some, you know, had I done this again, I'd probably be a little more careful when establishing the temperatures at this stage. Uh, I'd probably pay close attention to where the cool colors are. Uh, for example, uh, some of the hats should have been established initially with a cool color and not a neutral color like I have here. You see a lot of grays in the middle. Shouldn't be grays, it should be more blues. But that's fine. Uh, the initial wash isn't as important as some people tend to think. Um, now, if you look at his work, he doesn't do too much wet and wet. He didn't do a lot of that. It was mostly, and I'm going to blue, by the way, blew up her shirt in a moment. Uh, 
Uh, he didn't do too much too much wet and wet. It's mostly just um, just filling in the sections that he wants. Um, it's a very interesting approach. It removes a lot of the pressure uh, doing things that way. Now uh, look at the uh, canvas or the uh, well, it's watercolor, so <laughs> I suppose it's paper. Uh, I don't mind. There's a highlight on top of the paper or the block, whatever it is, uh, right where I just painted now. I'm not concerned with leaving each and every highlight here, okay? Uh, I can always come back with some opaque paint and get it, or maybe with my white gel pen that everyone always asks what it is. It's a Uniball Signo, Signo I guess, S-I-G-N-O, Uniball pen. Um, and yeah, I can always come back with that uh, and fill in those white areas. I don't want to ruin the fluidity of the wash. Now, one important thing, uh, they, people keep asking me and I always forget the colors I'm using. <coughs> so sorry that I'm always late on that. Uh, the colors I'm using are basically quinacridone rose for the warm, uh, for the cool reds. Okay, that's mostly quinacridone rose. Very little pyrrole scarlet. Um, a yellow that's very similar to nickel azo yellow, actually. I don't remember which one it is, but it's just a nickel azo yellow. Uh, it could actually be it. Um, and for the blue, I'm using both Thalo Blue and French Ultramarine, but for now, what you see me mostly use for this wash is Thalo Blue, okay? Um, so I'm using, I'm very um, commonly using the Split Primary palette that uh, Patrick Lee Greaves from Pure Watercolor Channel, a really good channel, um, has talked about several times. He hasn't posted a video in a while, but uh, check it out. He's got tons of, of gems from the past. Um, and the split primer is basically just a warm and a cool of every primary color. I keep it simple. I don't need too much for starters. I find that using a lot of colors confuses me. Um, and if I'm using colors freely, freely, I usually care more about the temperature. So it's just a means for getting the temperature I want. Okay, I'm not too concerned with specific colors. You can do magic with any color. It doesn't really matter as much. Unless you're aiming for a very specific color. You know, if you're trying to mix the exact color you see, maybe you do need to think about your color selection a little more. Uh, so anyway, obviously this dried, okay, I allowed it about 30 minutes to dry. Uh, that's what I usually do between washes or if I have direct sunlight in the in the studio or apartment, I'll put the painting under that or I'll use my hair dryer. Uh, I think actually here I used my hair dryer, it's just faster. Um, and I'm just starting from whatever section, it doesn't matter because it didn't matter to uh, Sargent as well, it seems in many cases. And I could be wrong, by the way, everything I'm saying is just guess. And obviously you can't ask him, and I don't know if this information is even, you know, you can find it anywhere, I'm not sure. Uh, what I am taking care of doing is exploiting wet and wet. I know he didn't do much of it, but I do want to do more. Um, because right now, essentially, I'm working on smaller sections. I have more time, I have more patience, I can really take my time and... Um, you know, at my leisure, make sure I get everything right. For example, I mix the blue here because it's beautiful. Look at it. I really love this color, uh, the French ultramarine in this case. Uh, and it contrasts really nicely with the yellows, the yellows uh, down below. So you see, always he always had that in mind, it seems. Um, and it's important to remember that probably some of his paintings yellowed up with time. So a lot of the yellow where the whites are could account for that. That could account for it. Um, so that's another interesting thing. Um, I never really ask in the middle of the video, but if you're enjoying this one, I would really appreciate it if you just drop a like uh, and subscribe if you still aren't. Uh, dropping a like really helps more people find uh, the video and I really appreciate it. Uh, so definitely do that if uh, you enjoy it. Um, and leaving a comment helps as well. Uh, so now you see I'm just establishing the shadows on this area. I'm staying on this area until I'm done with it. Um, and, and yeah, again, I just, uh, sorry to remind you every second, but I'm really curious to hear if that's kind of a thing you enjoy to see the process really in detail. I know it can be boring to some, sorry if that's you. <laughs> and look at this beautiful transition from cool up top to warm down below. Uh, it's a very gentle one and I tend to exaggerate these a bit. He was a little more fine tuned here. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful transition. It's all the, the same kind of French ultramarines or some kind of a, a gentle blue together with a gentle ochre yellow, which I ran out of, uh, unfortunately. So I will have to get up. I love yellow ochre. Um, oh, actually, I have some. 
I have M grams, but it's a, uh, hmm, I think it's a bit of a weird one. We'll see. Um, and as I mentioned, exploiting wet and wet. Now, what I care about here is I do want to make sure to get all of our clothing in one go and have it flow as much as possible. So I am working very patiently and, and seemingly slowly, uh, but I'm also very quick in whichever place I can. Okay, so always have that balance. What what I always equate this to is while you're, um, it's like this concept by, by an entrepreneur I love, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk. He says uh, macro, what I call it, macro patience, micro speed, which means that every day when you're doing the tasks and you're working on whatever it is, your work, your business, you work fast, you work at a really good pace, but then uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, when you look at it in terms of years, you're patient. Um, and that keeps your motivation up for longer. So the same concept I think applies to painting. While you're with the brush on the paper, you want to work patiently. You don't want to hurry. I see a lot of people hurry. They're, they worry that the wash is going to dry. They worry a lot of things. And yes, speed matters, but sometimes it's so counterproductive because if I just go and blurt out this awkward brush mark over an area I shouldn't have, it's not always easy to correct and sometimes it can be detrimental. Sometimes even if you lift most of it, just a little bit that stayed can ruin a painting. So take your time when you're on paper, but then once you're in the, on the palette, I also want you to take your time, but just be aware of what's going on on the paper, okay? Um, and this can be applied also on a more macro level, like when you make a painting, work patiently, but uh, work, uh, what do you, <laughs> I wanted, I had a good analogy in mind, but in any case, I probably lost it. <laughs> so I'm gonna continue here, I'm starting to warm things up, okay? So we got a lot of the blue up top, and now you see the burnt siennas starting to creep in. Now at this stage, I'm starting to feel like I need to switch to a smaller brush, so I may return to that. Um, but my goal here, this is, it's not that hard of a wash and I'll tell you why. Because it's just one big shape. All I need to concern myself with is skipping the palette in the middle. That by the way, if you haven't noticed, it's actually a palette. Uh, that's a really cool um, way of painting a palette. I liked how he approached it. Um, all I have to worry about is going around the palette, perhaps going around the easel that shows up a little in front of the figure. Um, I painted over the details, I guess it's buttons or some kind of clips um, uh, on her chest. It seems like she has this detail in the clothing, so I wanted to get that in. But for the most part, not too difficult of a wash. Now, if you find that your washes dry really fast, you get a lot of uneven edges, which by the way, I got a few of these here. Um, I don't want you to worry about it too much. There are plenty of ways of fixing it. Um, I would say the easiest and best way, just if you're a beginner, is to use more water. You may be using too dry of a mix. I don't want to tell you to work faster. Or I don't want to tell you, you know, because that maybe you're, you work as fast as you can while maintaining control. Uh, by the way, doing wet and wet, getting the shadows in, indicating the hands using them and where all the folds and creases are. Uh, but in any case, I don't want to tell you to work faster necessarily. What you can do is really work wetter. And if you mix wetter paint, very often that will be a good cure. You can use a spray bottle to spray some water on it, get it to stay wet for longer. Uh, you can use a bigger brush, which is also something I... Usually when someone at least had some formal uh, education in watercolor, meaning they watch like a video or something like that, not even formal, um, people are aware of this. So I, don't, I didn't see too many people using it, but I did see one person who painted really with a thin brush and it was detrimental, it was really rough uh, because they couldn't get anything, any of the details really um, fast enough anyway, so the small brush doesn't even help. Uh, it can be useful if you're working on fur and textures, stuff like that, but for the most part it's unnecessary and it stands in the way. Now look at how my approach really at least aspires to mimic how he painted, because what I'm doing is uh, working on just this center shape. I don't worry too much when the, the person is essentially one shape, all of her clothes and everything. I'm not worried about the fluidity of her shape together with the background or all of that. And some may say that's a mistake and I should, but you know, I'm trying to mimic Sargent here, so I'm fine with that. Um, and by the way, we're almost halfway through because a lot of the process was in drawing. 
Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to work on this on a shape by shape basis. Now you may say, okay, so how will everything work together if you're focused on individual shapes every time? So I'm gonna take you back in time to the initial wash. Remember, this was the reason why I did it. I didn't feel comfortable to just tackle it directly with the smaller shapes and I felt like it won't lead to the result I want. So I did an initial wash that unifies the whole thing and then I can afford it to work on these smaller shapes. And I will work on the background too later, you'll see. Um, so that's gonna be really nice. Now, while I have this dark paint, I thought I'd just put in some of the black sections I see. Uh, but very soon, I'm just going back to some uh, skin tones and some other details for the, now it's the easel. Um, and again, I'm gonna make some of the shapes on the easel read a little better using some opaque paint later on, um, using my trusty i'm gonna get it for a moment because i always forget what color it is so just a second it's a white by shinhan pwc and i want to tell you exactly what it's called so it's jean brilliant it's i suppose french uh jean i believe is yellow so it's j-a-u-n-e and then the word brilliant essentially it's a pwc uh, shinhan color pwc is their artist grade line so get only that don't get the other ones um it's a light fast fairly light fast color it's opaque and it just is a great warm um warm white i love warm white so um you know some people use the more neutral ones maybe even cooler ones uh, i find that it works less well for me maybe more in acrylics uh, which I do want to try doing more of. So same thing for this figure. I'm starting with the head, just top to bottom. Uh, watercolor makes sense to work top to bottom, unlike different mediums where you can kind of work wherever you want. Flow is kind of a big deal <laughs> in watercolor, you probably have noticed. Um, and you want to make sure that the painting flows easily uh, and, and blends together. So once you get the paint moving in some direction, it can help with the fluidity. Okay, if you put the paper flat, it can lead to many problems. Um, I would say, especially for uh, paintings with large washes, it doesn't even matter as much with this kind of a painting, but if you work larger, then really, you, you really want to, um, yeah, just you, you really want to put the paper at an angle. Now, you saw me charging some red into the face. This is very common for me. If I feel like the temperature's off, I'll just grab a bit of paint and put it in there, charge it in, in get it to look the way I want. Um, because again, for me, I'm more about the temperature. I don't care as much about the specific color. I am striving to imitate his colors to some degree, obviously. It is a study. <laughs> um, but I want you to, to consider one more thing. Uh, a big deal with studies for paintings is not just the painting stage, but the drawing stage and the planning. So when you look at this um, painting, it, you ask yourself, why did he decide to paint it from this angle? And there are many reasons for that. Maybe the light looked best from here. Maybe he liked how, for me personally, I like the distancing between the, um, between the figures, <laughs> like social distancing. I like how uh, they're um, kind of divided along the scene. So I like how um, two figures are closer, um, the um, Emily and the nephew on the left and then the one on the right is a little farther and it just leads to some interesting variety and notice how he wasn't even worried about having her close to the edge of the uh, painting because he essentially cuts out um, a part of her or really puts her close to the edge of the painting uh, so you don't have to worry to, to not worry but rather you don't have to be scared of trying weird things um, from a, pr a composition standpoint um, because a lot of things that don't seem to work, to, that you don't initially think will work, actually end up working. Um, so now I'm just rendering the bottom part. I'm continuing while I have this color and I'm just graying it over uh, to her shoes. Now, I do want to say something about the colors. I am obviously taking a lot of liberties here. I'm changing a lot of stuff. But in addition to that, and <laughs> I now see how inaccurate I was with the figure on the right, by the way. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, I actually, I took a picture of the painting with my iPad because it was faster than finding the same picture online with it. And I just don't know of a better way to transfer files between the, the iPad and the computer. So I actually took a picture of my computer screen that may have skewed some of the colors. So my apologies, I may be working from a bit of a skewed picture. 
I mean, I owe that apology more to myself because it hurt my result. You know, for you, it's not that big of a difference, actually, uh, as someone who's looking at the process. Uh, so, yeah, now you see, as I start to put in some background, what happens is that, look at her shirt on the right. It's actually lighter than some of the background. So the darker background helps to accentuate that and bring out her... Uh, the the sense of three dimensionality and volume of her. Uh, and now we're on to the umbrella. Now look at the color. It's v a very turquoisey green blue. I don't have that color with me. Uh, I should have probably mixed some white, some of the John Brilliant Brilliant into that. I think that would have gotten it to look a little similar. It's a color that I still I don't think I ever used the turquoise like a proper turquoise. Uh, the closest I got was like a phthalo green or a phthalo blue, but I do believe you can achieve a similar color if you add a bit of um, white watercolor to it. Um, white can make the color a little more. I actually need to start using more white paint be for that, for mixing, because it does add a bit of... Um, it's another means of mixing the color you want because with watercolor, if you want to make a color lighter but preserve the saturation, um, it's a bit different, I guess, from acrylics where you see the actual color. You look at your color and you see what it's going to look like. With watercolor, it's not the same. There's the element of transparency. So perhaps using some opaque paint, and let me know in the comments if you have experience with this. Perhaps using some opaque paint can help with this. And by the way, thank you so much if you're, you've stuck till this point and you actually watched the whole thing. I mean, it's crazy. I know it's a long video. Uh, but once in a while, you know, I'm trying to make the videos for actual viewers and not for the YouTube algorithm. Um, you know, YouTube favors if, if there's a long watch time on a video. I know the videos that succeed are the ones that just get a lot of clicks and a lot of watch time. So if a video fails, quote unquote, and gets fewer views, it's because and most of my videos fail. That's like, I mean, the baseline is the low views. And then once in a while you get lucky, so to speak, and a video really speaks to people. Uh, that's normal for any creator. Um, so they don't really fail as long as they deliver the message, but um, it's too bad that many of them don't get to more people. And oftentimes the videos that I perceive as the best are not the ones to succeed. And the videos that uh, are maybe quicker to make, maybe um, more, I don't want to say more shallow because not necessarily even, but these are the ones that tend to succeed. So you, you can never guess. Uh, here's another example of, again, maybe white paint could help dilute this and make it more lilac-y because right now it's very much a phthalo and an ultramarine mixed together. Um, now look at her uh, dress on the left. That's a really nice arrangement of folds and creases and it was important for me to get that right. Um, and I think it really um, complements uh, the, the composition because she sits essentially really next to Emily in the middle and she leans a bit towards her. So I like that. I think her uh, right leg is probably raised a little to turn towards Emily. So all of these small things is really, it's worth paying attention to. Uh, now, if you're having a hard time realizing or understanding what the shape of her leg on the left is, because it's it's under the dress, you can't even see it, uh, use the negative space around it. Look at the grass and maybe the blue next to it. I don't know if it's part of her dress, water in the background. I have no idea what it is, but look at the negative space, not the shape you paint, but the shape it leaves. And that can sometimes be a good trick for seeing things more clearly. Okay, I hope that helps. Uh, now I'm starting to put in the grass. Hopefully I'll get rid of that annoying white gap there. Um, and also I'm starting to put in some wet and wets. Uh, you see he did it. And if you look at his painting, uh, he probably used very thick, um, something similar to phthalo green. Uh, so it's good. I got a similar thing here going on. And he used it very thick so that it doesn't spread out too much. And that's a really nice effect. Um, you have to understand when you're doing a study by some of someone else's painting, you won't be able to get it to look the same way as theirs, especially with watercolor. Like, look at all the details in the background. It's just so many brush marks, and who knows what brush he used, the exact one, and because every brush has a different pattern of marks that it leaves, uh, different ways of holding them will affect it. So don't be too hard on yourself if you can't recreate it to the T, because you won't be able to. And uh, especially with watercolor, so much is left for, you know, randomness. So don't expect it of yourself. It's really impossible. Uh, I think it becomes a little more possible 
with more opaque media, but also then you get all these impesto paintings with thick uh, brush marks. You can't recreate that. There's no way. It's so hard. You, not at least not to to the level of it's. You can't tell the difference. That's that's why forging an artwork is so uh, probably close to impossible. You know, it is possible obviously, but it's really hard. Um, when you talk about sketches, it's a little more doable, I think. Um, when you limit the medium to pencil or something that's very controlled, yes. I believe you can create a better copy. And people do that. Like the Barg studies that people make where they recreate these sketches of statues that are highly detailed, super duper accurate. They are meant to be indiscernible from the original. That's really interesting. Uh, to see and I know people spend like 30 40 hours on some of these um, I don't think I have the patience to be quite honest uh, so yeah moving on with the background now we're about two-thirds of the process done maybe even three-quarters done I'm just adding the background what the background does is it frames up the characters it makes them pop to an extent um, the light in the painting itself is a little flat in terms of there aren't too many strong contrasts they exist here and there but mostly it's um slightly sunny i would say slightly overcast scene so it makes things a little harder and i find that getting a realistic impression when with those kinds of scenes is very challenging for me personally it's very challenging probably a lot of you deal with this too um, and Sargent was just a genius in getting these scenes to look so realistic in a way, you know, so, so impressionistic, but also so realistic. Um, so yeah, just huge, huge um, appreciation to this artist. Now I'm trying to figure out where I want to take this background and how I want it to look. I will add on top of that some dry brush marks for later, but my main concern is making the hat on the right pop. That's the that's really one of the main uh, purposes of the background here. So you see I'm painting carefully around it and this will just make her character pop a little more. Um, and it will enhance the sense of light. But still, you have to, to really observe this. The background is fairly light, so you don't want to go too dark there, uh, which I very often do the mistake of. Um, I will say that recently I have greatly improved in not killing off the sense of light. I used to do that so much in the past, uh, and now I'm way more on the patient side in which I won't go as dark, Many times I won't go uh, as dark on purpose. So uh, I just want to mention uh, this dried. I gave it another 30 minutes or so, and now I'm back for, sorry, touch the mic. Uh, and now I'm back for the dry brush section. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm really more on the patient side these days of trying not to uh, go too super duper dark with the uh, values. And, and sometimes it's even <laughs> too much, I think. Sometimes it would... Uh, benefit the painting if I can go a little um, darker. So now we're at around 37 minutes of narration. I need to remember that because I want to go back and make sure I don't kill your uh, ears <laughs> with that touching the mic. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, uh, moving on, just rendering the details. There is no way I'm going to get them exactly as he did. So I'm just doing my best. Uh, he uses w much brighter green i think it's lighter but it's also brighter i mean look at it it's so bright uh i don't really know how to produce that i should probably play around with it um and try harder <laughs> next time uh, now you see i'm making her shoulder a little smaller so hopefully i fixed some of the awkwardness there and that's a good thing with adding these darker backgrounds you can change the negative shapes you create around them uh, so yeah that's a plus plus. and at this stage you see my colors are fairly muted generally speaking uh, my reds aren't really red and my, it's more of oranges and greens and purples but even those it's it's even closer to tertiary colors so it's not it's definitely not perfect uh, secondary colors it's not like pure purple pure orange pure green uh, which by the way this painting is dominated by um, pr uh, secondary colors it's more of tertiary so there's a lot of browns a lot of mud colors if you will and there's nothing wrong with mud you know um, if you're just getting the temperature you want and the, the color is close to what you wanted there's nothing wrong essentially with the brown colors or you know uh, i was also at fault of uh, worrying about them too much in the past it, 
just doesn't matter as much, you know. Uh, if you mix muted colors, that's fine. Uh, it all depends on the effect you're trying to achieve. Now we're getting to the face. Uh, this is a pretty central part of the painting, so I'm trying to work really slowly and carefully. You see, I'm putting my uh, pinky on the paper just to get it right. I actually messed up just a bit of the right side of the brush. It looks like it's a milk mustache, and <laughs> you'll see. Uh, but I like it. I still like the result. Um, now it's it's a really fun stage because this is really like drawing. You just put in some shadows here and there uh, to to better accentuate the shapes. We got the main details in. You could essentially stop now, but something lacks in giving it volume. <clears throat> That's what I think the the whole uh, details and dry brush tends to do. It adds a bit of volume to it. It gives it te texture and volume. Um, because when you have a lot of blended large shapes, it's not anchored enough <laughs> to reality in a way. It's very flowy and loose. But then once you put in these details, it anchors it immediately and it solidifies it. That's the word I'm looking for. You really solidify the different shapes by doing that. Okay. Now I'm also fixing shapes. Notice her dress or whatever she's wearing should be a little longer, go a little more to the sides. So I'm doing that. I'm working close to the previous shape and I'm making it larger. I'm making all of the necessary cor corrections. Same for her dress, the same the nephew or the short pants, rather, whatever it is. I make it longer. I, I change the shapes. I connect them here because there is a shadow connecting them. Um, actually, most of the area between them is shaded. Uh, I hope I get that later on. Uh, but in case, yeah, a bit of touches of, you know, darker color here and there. I'm trying not to overdo it because if it's, it goes too dominant, then you'll miss the beauty of the initial shapes. Uh, it's all a balancing act. Okay, you want to make sure you don't go too dry brush. You don't want to go too flowy. And with the obvious, um, uh, what do you call it? With the obvious exception of get the look you want. If you want a very flowy look, go for it. You know, always go for what you want. Um, so now we're at a stage where I'm going to add a couple of more details, uh, like for the palette and the hats, and I'm going to kill off some of the highlights, the pure paper white ones that you see. Um, there's a shadow, shadow on her sleeve that I want to add soon, just some touches of dry brush here and there. And then we'll add the yellow, the yellowy white opaque paint, and then we'll wrap it up. Some details for the palette as well I will add soon. Um, and this is pretty much you know done. It's starting to get this feeling like it's anchored to something. Um, and if you look at it from afar, especially, I think I did a good job. I actually surprised myself. It would be interesting to do another go off camera and obviously it will turn out better. And obviously I wouldn't have recorded it and then you wouldn't see it. The process, you'll just see the end result. Sometimes it is pretty frustrating. Um, finding that balance between just painting for myself, getting the better results and documenting. But I do hope that, and I talked about this in the previous video, I do hope that my skill of preserving my skill while filming improves. The skill of still being skillful even though I'm in front of the camera. Uh, I hope that improves as well with time. Now, look at one thing that I do have a tendency to do, and that is to sometimes even go too saturated in areas where I shouldn't. So, um, Emily in the middle, I go really, really blue. It's not as blue if you look at the reference photo. It's more like a gray that has variations of cool and warm. So, you want to pay attention to these things and just not go too, you know, too overboard. Uh, especially if your goal is uh, realism. I get so many questions. Uh, I think how I can always, I always think how I can connect them to this video. Um, I did, I did get a lot of uh, questions about simplifying lately. Um, and I will address all of these in the upcoming course. Okay, I'm working on, I'm filming the course really hard working on it uh, this month. Hopefully I'll finish filming it this month. Uh, so you'll get to see how to simplify in a variety of ways. And I'm going to demonstrate the same subject and how I simplify it in multiple ways. So hopefully, and by the way, now I'm working on the, that palette. Uh, so hopefully that will be helpful. I know uh, a lot of people struggle with simplifying, which is why I chose that for my next free course, as you know. Um, and it's going to be fully free, like no tricks, not, nothing. I'm just going to post it, uh, drip it into YouTube, probably probably every, you know, every normal video day. So these are just going to be the videos for the next, I guess, couple of months. It's going to be, uh, maybe there will be like 
10, 12 lessons, something like that, maybe 15, I don't know. And I'll just post, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, and, and here, by the way, this is the white opaque paint. It's beautiful. Look at it. It's warm. It's really a nice one. John Brilliant, uh, PWC Shinhan. Uh, they're really good. They're a really good cheaper alternative to uh, other brands. I really recommend Shinhan. Um, so yeah, I, I hopefully the free course uh, that I'm going to do just every Tuesday, Thursday, and, f and Saturday here will help uh, with simplification. Um, <clears throat> I always try to improve my teaching skills and, and improving my own skills so that I can teach better. Um, and hopefully it goes through in the videos, really. And, and let me know your thoughts uh, on these kinds of long videos. We're going to wrap up in like 20 seconds, I think. So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on, on videos like this one. I know it's super long. If you've actually watched the whole thing, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, it means a lot to me. And if you skip to this stage, then I, I get it. Like, but I'm curious to hear uh, what your interaction with it was. Um, so yeah, just final touches right here and there. And we can wrap it up. Okay, so here is the final result. Once again, plenty of differences uh, in the way I did it and he did it. Obviously, a lot of skills in the original one that I am probably lacking. Also different, uh, sorry, move the camera. Also different uh, materials, different, you know, circumstances, secondhand impression. But even despite and through all of these, uh, let me zoom out a bit, even despite all of these, uh, there is still some of the magic of the original, I think, and at least the subject is clear, it's clear that we're looking, hopefully, uh, at a study of it. Now what I want to do is remove the tape together, just to show you the clear frame. It doesn't really matter always to me, but I know a lot of people want to see this. There is something nice about um, seeing the borders, and I keep moving the camera, my apologies. Uh, seeing the clear borders of a painting, there is something uh, nice to it. It turns it officially, perhaps. Uh, into a painting. But here we go. Uh, some of the camera mutes some of the colors. <laughs> My apologies about that. I will try showing you perhaps a picture of something clearer of the process um, and also the final result. And with that, now let's wrap it up face to face. So thank you so much for watching. As you've seen, quite a challenging scene. I did my best and I think I was able to capture some of that, some of the sense of uh, place and perhaps story. Uh, there is a lot to improve, but I think I may, if it interests you, let me know in a comment down below. I may uh, do a similar one with a simpler uh, painting of his, perhaps a simpler landscape or even a cityscape for that matter, but maybe not something as complex as this one. Let me know your thoughts. Don't forget to drop a like and a comment down in the video. This really helps me reach new people. Thank you so much. Subscribe if you still haven't. I have tons of videos like this one and I will see you again in the next one real soon.